But um, my message today is entitled, and you may know this story as uh, the prodigal son story, but really, that's really a misnomer because this message, this passage of scripture here about the father, um, he had two sons, and I'm naming this message the father that had two screw-ups. And uh, we always talk about the errors of the younger son, but if you read through the story, you'll see that the, that the older son was really messed up as well, right? And so I'm just going to read through it, and then I'm going to make some commentary, and uh, I'll get you guys out in the beautiful weather before you know what happened to you. <laughs> That I'm hurrying or the beautiful weather? <laughs> it's all right. You're welcome. It's the beautiful weather, right? What, now, we actually, I want to I give my hat off to Mark and Ramona who made and financed these beautiful curtains. Are those awesome? They're, they're fantastic. And... Uh, they're like really nice, like a movie theater or something. They're very nice. But um, those will shield you from the beautiful weather until the appropriate time. Because I tell you what, the Bible calls us sheep. And I, last, last Sunday, I think Anna just went across to check the thermostat. And I, was really, I thought I was making a really powerful point. And everybody just like, bah, bah. And nobody was paying any attention. They were just look, you know. There's a woman walking across the stage, and I can't receive anything spiritually right now. And uh, it was funny. It was frustrating, but it was so funny. But this is going to help you focus, because a lot of times when, if I see people starting to drift, I'll see them, you know, there's cars going down the highway, you know. <laughs> Aren't we like that? There it is. Sweet. I got something about Obama on there. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. Dad, dear dad, thank you for helping me. You are special because you are funny. <laughs> I love when you help me love Anna. Isn't that sweet? That's awesome. That's awesome. I love my girl. So, um, Father's Day is awesome. So anyway... The father who had two screw-ups. We're going to be in um, the uh, book of... Oh, I've got to get my notes right here. Sorry. When I cut and paste, I don't always put the chapter in verse. I know it starts with verse 11. Help me. I think it's Matthew 14, is it? Somebody help it. Help me. I cut that all out. I'm sorry. I really wanted to... Somebody's going to find that right now, right? Hmm? Oh, no, that's not it. No, it's the parable of the lost son, the King James, New King James says. I really wanted to preach Jesus today, and so I'm going to preach something that Jesus taught. But actually, what's that? Luke 15? Does it start at 11? That's it. That's it. Good, good. Help me. That's good. So... Um, Actually, I really had it on my heart to preach Jesus and um, the works of Jesus. But I wanted to bring this out in the Father's Day message. But you know that you can learn a lot about the Father through the Son, Jesus? Because Jesus told Philip what? He said, he who has seen the Father has seen me. And there's really no delineation in the heart if you look at Jesus or if you look at the Father or you look at the Holy Spirit. A lot of times the, the father has been painted as this crusty old guy that doesn't have any mercy. And if Jesus hadn't come along, that we'd all be toast, right? 
I have a feeling that when there was this conversation in heaven about saving all of humanity, Jesus, the, the Father wanted to do something, and Jesus volunteered to go. But they had the exact same heart. Amen? And really, all three persons of, you know, we can break them down, and I've been studying a book on the Holy Spirit, about having a relationship with the Holy Spirit, which in a lot of circles people don't, don't uh, believe that's scriptural. But it very much is because they're all God. You can talk to any one of them. You can talk to the Father in Jesus' name. You can talk to the Holy Spirit directly, however you want to do it. But they're all God, and they all have the same heart. And so whenever you see Jesus going about healing people, that's the heart of the Father. When you see him casting out devils, that's the heart of the Father. When you see him taking up little children, that's the heart of the Father. Amen? But we're going to look at this, starting at verse 11. Then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger uh, of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of good that falls to me. So he divided, them, uh, he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and sent him to his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, no one gave him anything. Wow. That's where I was 29 years ago. I was raised in a very good home, upper middle class, big house in Plymouth, and something went haywire somewhere, and I found myself like this guy. It says when he, he said, he came to himself. I finally came to myself. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? You know, it didn't work out very good for this guy not honoring his father. It says you honor your father and your mother and it'll go well with you. And the converse of that is also true. If you don't honor your father and mother, it will not go well with you. That's the word of God. I will arise and go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf and bring it here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he's found. And they began to be merry. It's like, like Clay is saying, there's a lot of joy when somebody gets saved. It says all the angels in heaven rejoice when one person gets saved. Right? We should be really happy. We should be really, really happy. Not like this next guy we're going to read, read about. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. 
It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother is dead and alive again. What's going on? Too much prayer. We've got to back off on the prayer in here. Okay. No, we're not going to do that. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and alive again. He was lost, and now he's found. Hallelujah. It just starts out, a certain man had two sons. It doesn't tell a lot about this guy. He obviously had some wealth because he had an inheritance to give to both of his kids. And the inheritance that the, that the younger son went out and blew, it must have been quite a bit because it says he went out and he lived for a while and, and did riotous living. How many know what riotous living is? <laughs> How many know when you're out in the world that riotous living is usually Friday and Saturday and then you're broke for the rest of the week until you can do riotous living again on Friday and Saturday the next week, right? But he went out and did riotous living for a long time and he blew this inheritance. But this inheritance was half of what his brother had coming because in that culture, the older brother got the double portion, okay? And this tells you a little bit about what the jealousy was with the, with the older brother who had been there because after it says that he divided the portions to the younger and the older brother, now, now everything that the younger brother had, he had, and he went out and blew, and now everything that was left was the older brother's, right? And so when the dad gets happy and he kills the fatted calf, whose fatted calf is that, actually? That's the older brother's. That didn't go over so well. And the fatted calf was enough. It, it wasn't like a pig roast. This was a cow that they had fattened. It was enough to feed a small city. And he's like, you never gave me even a little goat. I didn't even get a goat for a party. And now this guy goes out and he's doing drugs and buying hookers and everything. And then now he come back and he give him enough food for a whole city for a party. And they didn't, obviously... He was just being lavish on the sun because they didn't have enough time to invite everybody to eat this thing. They're just like, kill it. It's, it's worthy of just, if, just like the woman that broke the alabaster box at Jesus' feet. This is a year's wages. It's just, he's worthy. And the father was saying, this is a worthy event that this guy has come to the end of himself. Whew. I don't know why I'm so emotional. I'm sorry. So, but this father, it doesn't say a lot about him. It doesn't say anything about the mother, okay? It doesn't mention a mother at all. Maybe this guy was a single parent. Because, you know, your, li your life expectancy wasn't real long back then, man or woman. And it was, it was, it was very common to outlive your spouse and then get married again. You know that Finney... I, I was, Charles Finney used to be my idol, and I read all about it. And I read that, and, and, and it's been a while since I have, but I read that he had five or seven wives. And I was like, what kind of a philanderer is this guy that he went through seven wives? He outlived them all. They all died on him. You know, you get cholera, and it's not like you just go get some penicillin, and it's like, boom, you're dead. And so... He outlived five or seven wives. And, uh, and so maybe this guy, I'm thinking, I'm reading into it, but maybe this guy was left alone with these kids. And maybe the loss of their mom is what screwed both of them up. Because you know what? When you lose a, a parent, it can do something in you. You can get mad at God. And you can still be a good church person or whatever, but you can get really angry with God. Divorce can do the exact same thing. And so maybe this happened and maybe this is why the, the older, uh, the younger son became uh, very ungrateful for what he had there at the farm and very short-sighted. Just said, you know, eat, drink, and marry, be merry. Tomorrow we die. And the older boy just went into being religious. You know? And, had he, and he felt like he had something coming to him because he was such a good boy. But the younger son, he didn't appreciate all that was his. 
And the older son wasn't thankful for everything that was his, right? But it's, it's, fruit, it's, it's two different fruits of the same tree of unthankfulness. Isn't that right? So uh, he had two sons. It says that when he was out uh, spending his, his uh, inheritance out in the world, he joined himself to a city of that country. Have you, do you ever remember the chick tracks, the chick comics and everything? Does anybody remember those for witnessing? Am I that old? There's a guy who was an illustrator and he had these amazing chi uh, chick tracks. One of my favorite ones was um, Bad Bob. Do you remember those? Shelly remembers those. They're little booklets. Yeah, they're awesome. But he had comic books too and he had, a co I remember he had this comic book of the prodigal son story and uh, and it, it just depicted his whole life, and it was really cool, and, you know, the prodigal son became a jet setter, and he had all kinds of friends and everything, until what? His money ran out, and then he was sleeping with the hogs. But it says that he joined himself to a city of that, citizen of that country. When you're out in the world, and you're not under the Father's blessing, and when you're not in right standing with God, you're going to get in wrong relationships that are going to get you bound. And unless you break those things loose, you're going to find yourself staying there. But what I love here, it says he came to himself and he realized how good he had it back in his father's house. He probably couldn't see that. There might have been a hurt. There might have been an issue. Maybe his mom died. Maybe his mom left him or whatever. They didn't really do that in those days. But he realized everything that he should have been thankful for instead of just running out in the world. And he rehearsed this. And he said, he said, how in 17, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? I will arise, go to my father, and I'll say to him. And so he had this all down. How many have been there in their life? It's like, I'm going to go back to, you know, I've talked to people out in the world. You know, I'm going to get back to church. And, and they're, they're rehearsing in their mind, you know, what am I going to tell God? He, you know, hey, God knows everything anyway. He probably, you know, uh, he probably just kind of, go on and just talk to God because he already knows anyway. But he rehearsed, he said, he said, I'm going to say this. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. That'll do it. That'll, he's going to sell the father on the idea. <laughs> like, I don't have to be your son anymore. I don't have to wear sandals. I don't have to live in the house. If I could just leave, live in the servants' quarters and get three squares a day, that would be awesome. I'll be no trouble. I'll work. It's got to be better than feeding these pigs. So he gets this whole pitch in his mind, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, how did this guy see a great way off? And how did he just happen to see him coming? I think his father, I think his father spent a lot of time looking out the window looking down that road. Maybe he had an ancient telescope. But he was looking forward to that day. That's the heart of a father. That's the heart of a father. Was it Pastor David talking about that he didn't have his heart all closed up? You know, the father could have been rehearsing into my, in his mind, if that son of mine ever comes home, I'm going to let him have it. And I'm going to make him a servant. He's going to wish he was still a son. He could have had that heart. But he, I bet he was looking out that window. It's like, ah, will he ever come back? And he saw him. And it says he ran. You know, it's very undignified for grown men in that day to run. They had to be stately. You know. This is my farm. He ran. He didn't care. He didn't care about his dignity. That's like the father in heaven. He didn't care if he associated with me when I was using and out in the world. God doesn't care. Jesus didn't care about what the Pharisees thought about him when he was partying with sinners. Did he? He didn't care about his reputation. Do you care about your reputation? I don't care. God, we've gotten so religious. We have gotten so dang religious. I hope this church is not religious.
His father saw him, had compassion on him, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. So the son tries to rehearse this line. <laughs> it's like, this is my big moment. It's like, get a clue that everything's going to be okay. You don't have to sell him now. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be your son. But before he got out the, the part, he just let me be a hired servant. The father interrupted him. And he said to his servants, he says, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. The robe speaks of covering. The Bible tells us that, a lo that love covers a multitude of sins. When you, when you come into that love of the Father, all your sinfulness goes away. I know that for me, when I accepted Christ, it was like all the garbage that had been piling up, all the dishonoring I'd done of the Father, my parents, all the sins that I've done, it was just like it was flushed out head to toe. Love covers a multitude of sin. This, the ring speaks of love or marriage and security. There's such security in the Father. And that's what neither of the sons had, security. Even though they were in this great home, physically, something was missing in them that they didn't have security. The older boy had everything, but he wasn't happy. He wasn't pleased with it had jealousy in his heart. He had a bunch of garbage in his heart. The younger son had everything, but he just wanted to go out and see the world. So that ring speaks of love. It also speaks of sonship. There's a thing called a signet ring, and it's the family ring. And when you have that ring, the, they used to put the stamp on it, the seal of the, of the family, and you could stamp something, and, and you had the authority of the father and it, and it signifies authority. And then the sandals speak of blessing. Most of the servants at that time wouldn't have had any kind of shoes, any kind of sandals or whatever. So the father wants to. He said, don't talk to me about a servant. I want to restore you to full sonship. Full sonship. Something I noticed here, though, his father, and I've heard this before about the father bestowing this on him, but the father didn't do it himself. The father didn't get a robe and put it on him. He didn't get a ring and put it on him. What did he do? He, he told his servants to go do that. He didn't do it himself. He told his servants to do that. I think that's like the body of Christ. Sometimes we just send people to the Father. You, go, you get to the Father and you'll get honor. You go, get to the Father, you'll know sonship. Da, 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 da. You have to take... <laughs> You have to take daughters and let them know. You got to let them know they're in the body. You got to let them know. Right? You got to give them rings. You got to give your daughters rings in the body of Christ. You got to give the father's kids. You got to give them robes. You got to cover their sins with the multitude of love. Right? It's the servant's job. We're the servants in the house. Yeah, we're all sons and daughters, but when it comes to restoring people to the Father, they have to see it through us. Verse 25, now his older son was in the field, and as he came, he drew near the house. He heard music and dancing called one of the servants and asked him what these things meant. He didn't even, it's like, what does music and dancing mean? <laughs> the son didn't even know. It's like, what's that sound? <laughs> Guy's pretty out of touch with joy, isn't he? Out in the field, working away. I'm just the good son. I'm the obedient son out here in the field. My brother's off, catting around, but I'm the good boy. And then he's like, what is that? Uh, the servant's like, uh, that would be music. You know, you haven't heard it for maybe 20 years. You might want to get in touch with the joy of the Lord. And uh, so he said, you know, he told them, your brother has come. They filled the, the, killed the fatted calf. And 
But in 28, he was angry and wouldn't go in. I just, I would just like to do something to that boy in Christian love. That would be my heart. <laughs> right? Rock him to sleep with big rocks. But, but here's the heart of the father. The father came out and pleaded with him. The same way he ran down the driveway to see the rebellious son, he, he went out in the field to talk to the son that was broken in the other way, the son that was unthankful, the son that was jealous, the son that was bitter. He went out to meet him too. And he didn't yell at him. We can learn a lot by these examples. He, he didn't say, you jerk. Look at all you've got. You know, can't you be happy one day of your life? You know, he just said, hey. And he calls him this son of yours. <laughs> He's like disowned him. Right? He says uh, in 30, but as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood, quote unquote, half of his livelihood, with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. But here in 31, is so solid, he says, he said to him, son, you're always with me and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. He didn't argue with them. He didn't tell them how wrong he was. He said, this is what's right. Are you going to live with it? Are you going to deal with it? This is what's right. I'm not going to yell at you and tell you how wrong you are. This is what's right. When somebody comes into the house and they get saved, and they come back, I don't care what they've done, it is right to celebrate and rejoice. Amen? How many don't want to be like this religious guy out in the field when people come in here and get saved? I don't want to be that guy. Amen? I've been both of these guys over my Christian walk, honestly. But like I said, both of these guys' attitudes is fruit from the same tree, and that's unthankfulness, ingratitude. And so we're going to receive communion, and, um, and we're just going to ask the Lord to cleanse us from any attitudes that are unthankful. Father, I pray that you would cleanse us from anything that is uh, just rebellious, that just wants to go out and, and squander it all because we're about to give up on you. Or God, that we have an attitude that we, you know, we're good, we uh, tithe of everything we own, and we go to temple twice a week, and just like the guy, and uh, we want to be like the guy who beat his breast and said, Father, be merciful to me, a sinner. And we thank you, Lord. We humble ourselves before you. We thank you for the ultimate sacrifice where, Jesus, you came to earth kind of like the father going out into the field or the father running down the road. You came to earth and said, you, I want to make you my son. I want you to know and own everything that I've provided for you. And so we just receive that as we receive communion today and help us, God. Break us and give us a thankful heart for everything that you've done. We just love you. I pray our, our love would increase more, than, more and more, Lord. We wouldn't be motivated out of good works, but God, we become so motivated out of love for you and demonstrating the Father to people that don't know you, that don't know you, that are out in the field or that they're, they're out in the, the swine herd, Lord. I pray that you would just work in us, do something in us as we receive communion today.